Uh, I'm going to pray to just kind of kick us off. Father, we thank you. Um, just the opportunity to the freedom that we have um, to view uh, the border from in, in worship and thanksgiving uh, and, and we, we, the thing, whatever's going on in our lives we can before you. Um, and so as we take this time to remind ourselves, remind one another of, of who you are, of uh, how praiseworthy you are, God, I pray that uh, you would be with us here in this time. Um, and just say amen.
Don't speak in vain, a syllable empty or vain. For once you have spoken, picture in silence follows the sound of your voice. Involving in pursuit of what you said. In all of the hills of nature's soul, I can see your heart in everything you say. Every painted sky is endless now.
Um, this is, uh, it's been an interesting kind of thing to dive into and think about how are we approaching the scriptures, how should we approach the scriptures, what questions that we might have. And that's what I want to talk about this morning, the questions. Because I think there are the right questions to ask um, when we're approaching our scriptures, and I do think there's wrong questions to ask when approaching our scriptures. I think Ron alluded to this a little bit about a couple weeks ago, um, even just talking about like asking if the, the Bible, well, certain questions we can ask are just non secular ones, like, did Mozart win? Or, right? Like, like, it's like, I don't, if that's sometimes the way we ask scriptures questions, right? We're asking the wrong question. What do you mean? How does that even work, right? So, I'm going to talk quickly here about the, I think maybe the best questions we can ask and some of the bad questions that we can ask. So, the first thing would be this. Um, when we approach the scriptures, we ask the question, why were people inspired to write this down? Right? I think we still somewhat have an idea of the scriptures that they just fell down from the sky at some point in, in a book that was genuine leather bound. It's a classic here. And then we open it like, dang, this is all from God. Some people wrote all of this down at some point in history. Why did they write this down? This is a very, very important and uh, I, I think essential first question to ask. For example, um, like the first chapter of the, of the Bible, Genesis chapter 1. When was Genesis edited together? When, when, when did the Israelites put that book together? You guys know? It was when they were in exile in Babylon. The, the, all of the, um, uh, the Hebrews were in exile in Babylon, and the Babylonians had their own creation story, which is called the what? Come on. Yeah, yeah, yeah well, Numa Elish. I would say Numa Elish, but classy. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Numa Elish. And the, the Numa Elish is their creation story. It's how the, the, the world came about. And there's two gods, God Marduk and God Tiamat, I think. And Marduk kills Tiamat, tears their body, their carcass in two, and boom! The universe was created. That was their creation story. Fair and violent, right? Pretty messed up. This is, a, this is how the universe exists. It's through war. <clears throat> creation stories were incredibly important in the ancient world, and they are important to us just as much now, I think, because they root, um, they root and they ground us in a particular view of who we are and what we are doing here. And at the heart of the Babylonian story was this understanding that violence is the engine of creation. This is what, what drives things forward. That was how the world was created. That's how we got here. And the Israelites were conquered by the Babylonians, and they were hauled away from their homeland to this foreign land of Babylon, and where they were trying to maintain their sense of identity, their sense of tribe, surrounded by the dominant culture and stories of Babylon. So what do they do when they're in exile? They begin to compile the Hebrew scriptures. They begin to compile. This is when the Pentateuch starts getting kind of uh, compiled and put together. And it begins with a poem, right? It begins with their creation story. They say, no, we, this is how God created the world. And this poem, which is uh, in which the beauty and diversity and difference and order are all celebrated, it's a poem in which the engine of creation is divine joy. It's not destruction, it's overwhelming generosity. It's not violence, it's joy. Can you see why they found power and meaning in the Genesis 1 poem? Because it offers this competing creation story to their neighbors, the Babylonians creation story. It was confronted the dominant thinking of the world that they found themselves in with a different, better version of what it means to be human. That there's more, there's, there, there, there were people, um, <laughs> these are people that are miles from home, Longing to be free from their exile. Can you see why they would have found a ton of great comfort and hope in the Exodus story? A story of people a long time ago, they were also exiled. And God delivered them out of this. This is, this is a, a people wrote and compiled and edited these stories and texts and the scriptures because they spoke directly to the deepest questions and deepest needs in their moment at that time, especially, right? The early Gospels, the Romans, they conquered Israel, right? They, they, uh, it creates this deep sense of shame. I mean, if Israel believed that their God is the God of the universe, and then it's these other people, these foreigners who don't even acknowledge that God, took us over and are now like inhabiting our land and controlling us, can you see how this question would have just hung in the air? Where is God? Why would God allow 
these folks to conquer us? How would you, week after week, go to the synagogue and chant a prayer or a song about the goodness of God when there were Roman soldiers marching thousands at a time right outside their doors through the land, completely disregarding their laws? So when Jesus comes and he sees a demon-possessed man, and he says, what's his name? The man says, Legion. Well, that is also the, the term for the troops. A thousand troops was a legion. And so when Jesus casts out that demon, he's also telling these folks, he's, it's communicating, the, the, the author writing this knows this, is intentional about this. He's saying, he's also casting out the shame of, of what you're experiencing as these foreign invaders are conquering you. This is not all that's happening. There's always more going on in these scriptures. So people wrote these stories down because they found in them something that helped them restore their dignity, helped them get a sense of identity, and helped give voice to their pain. I don't know if you guys have any pain, but I need to give it voice sometime. Or like in uh, Corinthians, the New Testament, Paul, he's starting this movement, he's trying to stoke it, right, and spreading this intoxicating message that there's another way to live in this world through Jesus, the goodness and, of, of the good news is real. And he even uses this phrase, new humanity, that something very different is taking place right now. And the people that he's interacting with are stuck in all these old sorts of destructive modes of being. They're not getting it as quickly as he likes, as he likes. And so he's frustrated, but he loves them, and he's full of hope, but he's at his wit's ends. He cares deeply, but they're also driving him crazy. He's suffering for his work, but it's also doing something profound in him. He's having to address really practical matters like food, and who's sleeping with who, and what hair, how to, how to do your hair, and uh, marriage. And then he also writes things like love is patient, love is kind. He's all over the map. Why did he write all this in a letter? These are the questions that we get to ask as we're approaching the scriptures. Why did he write this down? Because he's got a giant heart for these people, and he wants them to see what he's what he's seen, so that they'll be filled with the same joy that he's filled with. Why did these people write this down? What was going on in their world, and why was it important to them? Why do they feel the need to put words to this? Start with those questions. So really, really good questions. The questions to not start with. Okay, the wrong questions to ask when we're approaching the scriptures. Um, it usually starts with, with something like this, these three words. Why did God dot, dot, dot? I mean, these are the wrong questions. They're, they're fine to ask, but when approaching our scriptures, you'll see why, it's a, why it, it, it's, a, it's a problem. I'm assuming you've heard some kind of versions like these questions, right? Like, why did God tell those people to kill those people? Why did God, why would God create people if we knew we were going to just screw it all up in the first place, right? Or why couldn't God have just skipped the sacrificial system? Why did Jesus have to die? Why couldn't God just save us in some other way? Why does God make it so hard to believe in God? <laughs> Anybody ever ask any of these questions before? Any of them. These are really, like, of course, they come up. They come up over and over and over. The problem with these questions um, is that they have a world of assumptions built already into them. Assumptions about God and about the Bible that will never get, you will never get a satisfying answer. And here's what I mean by that. If you were to ask the person asking these questions where they got these ideas and this, uh, about this being named God that they have these questions about, they would most likely reply, reply from the Bible, right? You see how this is a problem. We're approaching the script, like we, we already think we know what it says, and so then we go like, ah, you're not like that, God. You told me what you were like. I read that in the flat. In the same, you see what I'm saying? This is not the right question because we're already bringing our problems and our assumptions to it. The person asking questions like these already has a number of assumptions and beliefs and thoughts about God and the Bible that they are already bringing when they're reading the Bible. And so while they're reading it, they're constantly comparing that with what they're reading and what they've already decided about. This is who God is and what God is like. This is especially for true for folks that have grown up uh, hearing, uh, like in, in the church, right? Growing up hearing uh, about a particular version of God. It can be very, very difficult to read the Bible any other way. But... Uh, <clears throat> Let's start with, with, with this. I heard this, um, I read this a while back, and I love this kind of practice that we can have. It's a little exercise. Take all of your thoughts about God, 
all of your thoughts about the Bible, all of that, your beliefs, your skepticism, your convictions, your frustrations, your experiences, things people have told you, things that you've read, opinions about God that you do or you don't believe, all of it, right? Try and grab them all, picture them, imagine them each as like tiny little like coins, right? Each one, this is the one that says, you know, God is infallible, I don't know, whatever, right? Yeah, all of the little things that we think, this is what God is like, this is what the Bible is like. Try and picture them as like coins, and then take them and put them in your pocket, or stick them in a cup holder, or put them in a, in a, across the room. Try and remove all of your assumptions, and then boom, go to the Bible. Read the Bible. Just read it, because what you're going, what's going to happen is, <laughs> you're going to, uh, Read it with open eyes, without all of these preconceived assumptions blocking the way. What you're left with is the words on the page. Written by people, passed down by people, edited by people, decided on by people, inspired by God. But you're left with these words on this page. And so what we have, so when you read it, uh, when you read things like, uh, God told them to kill everyone in the village. Someone wrote that. Someone wrote that. That's how they understood that event. Don't drag God into it. Okay? They, they lived in a world that they believed that God was on their side when they went to war and killed everyone in the village. That was the dominant thinking of the time. And so that's how they understood and how they wrote their version of the story of what took place in their lives. What you're reading is someone's perspective that reflects the time and place that they lived in. It's not God's perspective. It's theirs. And when they say this is God's perspective, what you're telling you is this is their perspective on God's perspective, right? This is what we're left with. We're left with these stories. Don't confuse the two. The art and the challenge and the invitation in reading and studying our scriptures, which is what this is. Otherwise, it would be a textbook. It would be boring or we would memorize it once and be done with it. No, it's an invitation. It's an invitation. <clears throat> to be as aware as we can of our preconceived things, all those coins, throw them away, and just inviting us to enter in to what God is saying in the scriptures. Beware of any sermons in which point in which the point is to prove something about the Bible. The Bible is not an argument, okay? It is a record of the of humans experiencing the divine. And the point is not to prove that it's the Word of God or that it's inspired or whatever is the current word that people are using. Now, the point is to enter into it, enter into its stories with such intention and vitality that you find what it is that inspired people to write these books. Why did they write this down? When you find something inspiring, the last thing you're trying to do is prove that it's inspired. You're too inspired yourself, right? And that's what the scriptures offer to us. It is this living book constantly reading us as we read it. But we can't bring all of our baggage to it and think we're going to get out of it what God's intent. Does this make sense? Does this mean you can't think of If you're trying to prove what it is, you've already lost in the deep weeds. You have to let it be what it is. There are lots of passages that are, that are really mysterious. There are lots of words in the original languages that we just don't have words for. Um, there's all these practices and rituals that we don't have any context for. But if you keep your thoughts in a bucket over there, you keep your assumptions over there, and you read and listen carefully, you start to see the story behind the story, the story about people waking up to a bigger and more expansive understanding. And they understand what God is to be and what God is up to in this world right now. That's the, that was what leads, leads I think, to the next best question. The one you start with when you read the Bible. Why did people write this down? And then the other best question is, why did this passage endure? Why is it still around thousands and thousands of years later? Why do we have this? Why do people protect and preserve it? Why has God's hand seemingly been on this book for centuries? Why have people literally risked their lives to reproduce and distribute this specific library of books. And those questions will always lead you to even better questions. Why is this story passage first account resonated with people for this long? What does it teach us about what it means to be alive here in this world now? And this that question will lead you to this next one. What is it that was true about this book or story or poem or letter for them 
at that time, that's also true for me now. That is the goal. That is the goal, this application. How do we take these century-old, thousands-year-old words and stories and apply them to what's happening in our lives right now? It's hard to do, but you can see it. You can see it constantly. For example, Psalms. Psalm 13. How long, Lord, will you forget me forever? Or this one from Psalm 10. Why, Lord, do you stand far off? Why do you hide yourself in times of trouble? I've read that one a couple years ago. Isn't that you guys anybody? Um, or this one, Psalm 43. Why have you rejected me? Or this one, Psalm 83, about enemies. Make them like tumbleweed. Terrify them with your storm. Cover their face with shame. May they perish in disgrace. I mean, boom. This is like heavy, right? Anger, hurt, isolation, vengeance, rage, betrayal. It's all there. There's a lot of God is good in the Psalms, but there's also a ton of where the heck are you, God? I'm dying out here, right? This, these stories, the question is why are these poems and prayers endure? Because they, they, they speak to something true. We relate to them. We read them. Well, I've said that today. I, I, I don't maybe have the word enemies as much. I might put some names in there instead of just enemies, right? But that's about it. It's, like, it's so unbelievably relatable, especially the vicious stuff, the lines where the writer wants God to destroy their enemy. Who hasn't felt that? The Psalms show us what healthy spirituality looks like. You name everything that's happening inside of you. You give it language. You articulate exactly what the desolation feels like. <clears throat> that's the power of our scriptures. It's the power of the Psalms. When we approach our, 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 the Word of God, we're, we're entering into um, this like thousands and thousands of year old story of God interacting with His people. God, like we said a couple times, God never changes. But we sure do. We sure do. When I read my scriptures 20 years ago, I read different things than I read now. Did it change? No. Did I change? Yes. Did God change? No. That I, that, see what I'm saying? But we have this tendency to look back <clears throat> or to, to, to think there's one right. I, I don't even know how to describe it. It's to, this, the scriptures just are a truly living book in that way. Because I've never found another book that does that. <laughs> that, that changes constantly without ever changing. That is always like reading my mail as I'm rereading some ancient stories. I've never experienced something something as profound as what the scriptures are. But we have to know how to approach it. Why did God say this? The better question is, why do people find it important to tell the story? Why do people find it important? All of why. What was it motivated, that motivated them to record these words? Followed by what was happening in the world at that time. And then what does this passage, story, poem, verse, book, tell us about this? how people understood who they were and who God was at that time. And then, what's the story that's unfolding here? And why did these people think that it was a story worth telling? And what does it mean for me today? What is the living God trying to tell me through this living book? Action. That's always the final step in our scriptures. God is calling us into a deeper relationship with Him and a deeper relationship with others in this world around us. And the invitation of the scriptures isn't, you want to know what God's like here. The invitation of the scriptures is, do you want to hear the stories of thousands and thousands of people struggling to answer the question, do you want to know what God's like? Here we go. Well, no wonder it's challenging. No wonder it's confusing. No wonder we continue to study, we continue to learn, we continue to see and, and get more out of it because it's never over. It's, it's, it's an invitation. It's not a... Uh, Declaration. I had to find a way to make it rhyme. <laughs> uh, this is what this is. This is what our word is, and um, it's been challenging because I have a pretty orthodox, which that word to me is a traditional um, view of the scriptures. I don't like. I don't like taking taking too critical of an eye at it. It makes me worry. Right? It makes me like, what are you gonna do? But as I've been like kind of going through the series and like seeing more things, the more I feel like there is such an echo of the incarnation 
in the Bible they got. That it is 100% God, divine, and 100% human. <laughs> there are words on a page written by mostly a dude, sadly. Just some person, some time. But God is so present in it. There's such an inspiration in it that I don't know how... It is confusing. It is a, a contradiction. That's kind of the best answers that we have in our faith, I feel like. Our contradictions are our best answers. The men were like, no, it's well, this and nothing else. I feel like we missed it. Anybody know what I'm talking about? So this is it. Um, I, I might have one more on this series because I'm really I'm enjoying what, what, what we're learning here. But again, this is, this is what we talk about every single week, this word. Um, so don't, uh, don't stop coming. <laughs> <laughs> Let's pray, Jesus. Thank you. Thank you for this morning. Thank you for what you're doing in our church, in our lives, what you're doing <clears throat> through your word that it's preserved for thousands and thousands of years, and now we're the lucky few that have multiple copies in our home. How crazy is that? Help us to be grateful for the, for the blessing. Help us to be grateful for how, um, how good we have it when it comes to being able to um, approach and get in your word. Give us a passion for that. Give us humility, true humility, to let go of all of our preconceptions of who you are and to bring ourselves fully at your feet. And you can illuminate what, what truth there is for us today. Help us to go out and live that action in your name. Amen. Amen. Sing your benediction song together. This thing's good. May the Lord Yeah.